Hey everyone, I wanted to post a new video just to announce this cool new project that I have that's now finally available, which is uh, an audio course on the science of persuasion. I developed it with this cool group called Knowable. They're the web service that allows you to sort of listen to all sorts of cool audio courses built by experts in different fields. And because my research expertise is in attitudes, opinions, persuasion, all that kind of stuff, I developed a course called the science of persuasion. I'm super excited to have you check it out. It opens with a glimpse into the history of why psychologists even got into the persuasion game in the first place. Then we take a look at what it takes to be a persuasive person. What, what kinds of people are more persuasive when they deliver these messages? What kinds of messages grab people's attention? Why does one message work for one audience but fail with another audience? And all sorts of other stuff. So check it out. You can use the link in the description of this video to see um, more about the science of persuasion and audio course with Knowable. But also stay tuned because <laughs> right after you see my face, I'm going to play a clip from the course. So you won't see my face anymore. You'll see sort of a nice animation of an audio waveform with a clip from the science of persuasion. So check it out. Let me know what you think. Let me know if you have questions as you take the course. I'm happy to, to chat about persuasion. Um, but yeah, enjoy and see you on the inside. Companies spend big money on advertising to try to persuade you to like their brand. Politicians visit cities and give speeches to try to persuade you to vote for them. Your friends try to persuade you that the latest superhero movie is actually good. Environmental activists try to persuade you to lead a more sustainable life, and at family gatherings, we all try to persuade Uncle Robert that he's wrong about that conspiracy theory of his. Persuasion is a regular feature of communication, and people have all sorts of theories about how to do it better. But lucky for us, we now have study after study from social scientists who use the scientific method and statistical analyses to test which strategies work, when they work, and why they work. I'm Andy Luttrell. I'm a social psychologist. Social psychology is a type of psychology that focuses on how a person's thoughts, feelings, and behaviors are influenced by the people around them. And within that field, my research expertise is in people's opinions, where they come from, and how they change. Persuasion is a communication process that strives to change people's opinions and ultimately nudge their behavior. You may be interested in this course because you have persuasion goals of your own, and you're looking for concrete tips for doing so. If that's the case, you'll find plenty of science-based strategies to inform your own persuasion endeavors. And you may just be intrigued by the psychology of changing minds. Maybe you're looking for answers to understand where people get their opinions and why they change. If that's the case, you'll find lots of curious tidbits from the long history of research on the science of persuasion. If we go all the way back to ancient Greece, the 4th century BCE, we find Aristotle, regarded now as one of the greatest philosophers of all time. His influence has been vast, and the guy wrote about everything. But one of his lasting writings was his treatise on rhetoric, or the study of persuasive speech. Aristotle boiled rhetoric down to three basic means of persuasion. The first is the character of the speaker. If a speaker displays intelligence, virtuous character, and goodwill, his claims will appear credible. The second means of persuasion is the emotional state of the audience. If a speaker can arouse the right emotions, fear or anger, for example, he might succeed in gaining support for his position. And the third means of persuasion is through the logic of the argument itself. Does the speaker walk us through the inductive or deductive reasoning that leads to his conclusion? Even though this was hundreds of years ago, Aristotle was onto something. Throughout this course, we'll see that the character of the speaker, the audience's emotional state, and the soundness of one's arguments are, in fact, important for effective persuasion. But the science of persuasion really kicked into gear around World War II. Carl Hovland completed his PhD at Yale University in 1936. He rolled right into being a Yale professor where he studied all sorts of things, including learning and aggression. 
But as the war ramped up, the United States Army recruited Hovland to join the research branch of the Division of Information and Education in 1941. Their mission was to collect and analyze data on soldiers' opinions, testing the impact of the Army's orientation films. Hovland used his expertise in applying scientific analyses to psychological questions to conduct simple experiments, tweaking some part of a persuasive strategy to see if it affected people's opinions. And it's worth sitting in that for a second. As I mentioned before, psychology is a topic that everybody has their own intuitions about. Why does our coworker believe some nonsense? Why does our neighbor deny climate change? Why do our children hate vegetables? We chew on these questions all the time, and because we spend our lives as people, we think that makes us an expert. But there's all sorts of common wisdom, folklore, hunches, that are just plain wrong. What feels psychologically true or guaranteed to work may not actually be the case. Social scientists, however, we collect a bunch of data, looking at how all sorts of people react to this message or that message, and we apply statistical theory to check whether the patterns we're seeing are real or if they're probably just a fluke. That's what Hovland did. He didn't just watch a few propaganda films and speculate about which ones would work. He didn't just talk to a couple soldiers to see what they thought. Instead, he carefully measured the thoughts and feelings of thousands of soldiers who had, or had not, seen various films. Hovland's research has produced plenty of insights, some of which we'll touch on in this course, but perhaps more importantly, he inspired a vigorous area of research. More psychological researchers began applying these scientific methods to the study of persuasion, and by now, well, we've amassed results from hundreds, thousands of experiments that give us insight into when and why people change their opinions based on persuasive communications. Now, the good news is that we have this treasure trove of studies to learn from. The bad news is that those studies don't always tell a simple story. It turns out people are complicated. Who knew? As soon as we feel like we understand what messages get through to an audience, someone comes along and shows us how a particular strategy doesn't always work. By the 1970s, social psychologists started to feel uneasy about the research on persuasion. It seemed like new studies kept coming out, but the results painted a less and less straightforward picture of when and why people changed their minds. Now, as a scientist, this complexity is exciting. It poses challenges to be solved. We love nuance. The devil is in the details. But for practitioners, communicators, marketers, campaign managers, this complexity feels confusing. Just tell me how to convince my audience, some people might shout. And here's the good news again. Across all the ins and outs of persuasion science from the last 75 years, I do think there are key findings that show up over and over again. Some clear best practices and those are what I want to share with you in this course. But it comes with a caveat, which is that people are complicated. There is no magic persuasion potion that changes every mind. For every best practice I share in this course, there's at least one study that disputes it or says it doesn't always work the way we think it does. When we have a good idea of when a strategy works and when it doesn't, I'll let you in on that nuance. But there's no way I can go down every rabbit hole, and I, I don't think you'd want me to. So just understand that everything I share in this course is based on many controlled studies. So we do have confidence that we're talking about legitimate principles. But whenever you deploy a communication strategy in the world, there may be quirks of your audience, the topic, the context, your message, that have their own wily effects on people's openness to your message or their resistance to it. So let's dive in and see what the research in persuasion science tells us. Carl Hovland summed up the persuasion process very simply, noting that persuasion depends on who said what to whom. Not all that different from Aristotle's notion of persuasion by communicator, the audience, and the arguments themselves. And throughout this course, we'll look at these elements and see how they affect persuasion and how you can implement them in your own advocacy or advertising campaigns. So let's jump right in and start by looking at why people are often resistant to persuasion. 
and how we can address their major concerns.